I've personally always had a great interest in architecture, and I am privileged to live in a house that is uh, designed and built in the style of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, uh, put up by a Canadian architect uh, working in provincial Ontario who was very influenced by the arts and crafts movement and uh, fell under the particular influence of that genius from Glasgow. So as a consequence, we've always had great architects gracing this stage. We've had Gary, we've had Liebeskin, we've had Safdi, and today we're going to have Jack Diamond. All of these men are working today, this moment, in the city of Toronto, which uh, at one time, for reasons that are already obscure, was considered somehow in the avant-garde of uh, creating the livable city in North America, and then fell into a period of uh, complacency and uh, aesthetic neglect from which we're only just emerging, thanks to guys like Jack Diamond. Jack is uh, not only a theoretical architect, but a very engaged guy. He's active in teaching, and he's active in politics. Successfully, I might add, he took on what seemed to be a extremely long shot job as co-chair of David Miller's campaign for the mayoralty, which was fought on architectural and urban development issues, and uh, they came out of nowhere and they won. Jack Diamond. Well, uh, I thought that I was just going to talk about design in the purest sense. But the theme of my work is the life architecture formed by the life within and the life around it. And the life around it affects it as much as the life within it. And the life around it appears to be going to change in Canada soon. And I have the greatest misgivings about that. We only have to look at Ontario under Mike Harris and understand that Walkerton was inevitable. But if you cut taxes and you cut monies from the public sector, the consequences are that you either favor a few or you cut the services. And I know that Canadians don't want tax cuts, they want tax value. And I thought that perhaps I could show you from my perspective how those neocons who actually run, it's, it's one of the paradoxes, they run against government, but they're running for office. Uh, they want to take on government, but they're trying to get rid of government. They're trying to minimize it. Canadians traditionally have accepted intervention in the public interest. And they claim that it's better to let the private sector do all, all that it wants. It's an extreme, as I said, going swinging the pendulum outside of that balance so that, in fact, they are making judgments about intervention. They're not intervening, and the consequences can be profound if, in fact, it doesn't have good leadership in the public interest. And I'm going to now deal with something that I know requires intervention in order to correct an enormous problem. I was lucky enough to be a commissioner in the uh, Greater Toronto Area's uh, task force called the Golden Commission, and uh, it looked at the government's taxation, land use planning, and transportation of the city of Toronto. And if we built at the densities that we were building in the 60s, as opposed to the densities we're building now, and let me tell you the difference. The difference is that today, in Canada, we take three times the amount of land for our, for our development to house a person than we did in the 60s. We're becoming profligate in the use of land by the sprawl of the city. Well, Niagara and the Lake just recently measured that for every dollar assessment they get for their low-density low sprawl development, it costs $1.40 to service. You think it's crazy. I mean, it doesn't become apparent. What would you say about the analogy as a factory owner who is, has a factory and only using half his plant, and he built an addition? You'd say it's pretty stupid. That's exactly what we're doing in cities. And it's because we're not, in fact, intervening in the appropriate manner. We think that the private sector alone can determine that future. People, they say, make choices. They prefer the automobile. Well, if there's no alternative to the automobile, what else are they going to do? But the curious thing about automobile dependency 
is it creates immobility in the population. For those who don't own a car, because you can't afford public transit at very low densities, who don't own a car, who can't afford a car, or children who are too young to drive, or old folks who are too old to drive or don't wish to drive, there is no alternative. They're rendered immobile. The acceptance of diversity is exactly the crucible in which innovation takes place. It's that extraordinary tolerance and mix that contributes to the quality of life. And you don't get that in a suburb. I can drive through suburbs and tell you exactly the income level. It's segregated not just by land use, like just residential, but then it becomes segregated by socioeconomic grouping. And we are segregating our society. The car is like a centrifuge. It, it takes this compound and flings it out into its constituent parts. Density doesn't mean, because people are frightened of the word density, density doesn't mean poor quality. On the contrary, it means wonderful quality. Let me show you why we have choices and why intervention in the public interest is important. Look at these footprints. Um, if you take the group that are around the million mark, Top left, Edmonton, well, Venice is not that size of population, but you know its quality. It's 100, only 180,000. For those of you who can't read it, Amsterdam is the one to the top, uh, top right-ish, 735,000. Edmonton at the top, 937,000. Zurich, 935,000. Calgary, 950,000. Vienna, a million five, and smaller than Calgary then Houston, a million eight, and Toronto, 2.4. Clearly, very different size footprints for similar population sizes, except for the examples at the bottom. And which are the ones that have a good quality of life? Where do people go when they go on vacation to Europe? They go to look at the cities, the buildings that enjoy the life, the animation, the mix, the density at an acceptable level that creates that diversity and, and amenity. So quite obviously, we have a choice. But Houston, there is no choice. You only can go by automobile, even if you have to go buy milk. And have you ever been down in Houston after 5 o'clock? It's scary. There's no one there. You don't dare walk on the streets. The quality of life is abysmal, except for the very rich. Of course, who can opt out to a country house or go somewhere else? So quite obviously, Density doesn't mean, because people are frightened of the word density, density doesn't mean poor quality. On the contrary, it means wonderful quality. Let me go to the next slide. If you take 1,000 people and you put them in single family houses and you take about 2.8 average per house, you need about 39 acres. This is what we're building now on the perimeter of our cities. Next slide will show you that if we simply go to semi-detached, you need almost half. I won't go into the reasons why it's not exactly half, but almost half. Next slide. Uh, that's when it's row housing. It's the same area in the big map, but obviously occupying now about a third of that area. You can imagine the difference in costs in the hard infrastructure, let alone the policing and the social costs of spreading it over that big area. Next slide. And this is in uh, duplexes. Next. And this is in garden apartments. Next. And this is in low-rise apartments. Next. Medium-rise apartments. And we don't have to go there. <laughs> but you can see the effect of different choices. But of course, that requires regulation as well as incentives. You need sticks and carrots. At about 30 units an acre, you can afford public transit. We talk about subsidies to public transport, investment in highways. That tells you something about the mindset. And why do we have the lowest? Because they say people make choices. The fact of the matter is that the choices are being helped by public policy, by default and by inadvertent favoring of particular ways. And let me tell you how it happens in Ontario and for most of Canada. Provincial governments pay for the trunk line sewers and the expressways. The private sector only has to pay for the local and doesn't pay for the increment of making that van valuable by providing trunk line access. You and I pay for it in the downtown. 
That burden is borne by all of us for what the Pope has called extreme or excessive capitalism. But the capitalism is actually being subsidized by the taxpayer to the tune of expressways and, um, and, and trunk line sewers. From my perspective, uh, what we need to do is to have curiously what the conservatives always talk about but don't practice, and that is a real market economy. Let's have full cost pricing on that land. Let's assign the cost to that land of its true value or true cost in producing it. Then see what choices people make. If we in fact invest in our public transit system to the degree that we make free the expressways, let's then see what choices people make. I've shown you some cities in Europe, and in fact in parts of North America, certainly Montreal, certainly parts of New Vancouver, Seattle, Boston, and, the, and curiously the Americans are investing heavily in their cities now, recognizing that they are the engines of growth. They are the engines of competitiveness. When our city governments, and I fault them in one respect, when they say to the, to the federal government, we need more money because we have no power to tax, the provincial government takes our money, and we've got to provide the services. The cities themselves are not, in fact, creating the effective configurations of cities that should be funded. So I'm, in a sense, reluctant to advocate spending monies on cities until they get their house in order because there are better ways to do things, far better ways to do things. They can be more effectively done. But we need to talk about that, and we need to look at the levels of intervention that are required. Toronto, this, the Canadian cities were really good as an amalgam. There was an aggregate to them. We used our buildings in aggregate form to form wonderful streets. We have a wonderful park system. I remember it being considered and a neighborhood in Toronto was deficient if it, you didn't have a park or parkette within uh, a quarter of a mile of every house. That's what makes the great city. And all of the services, the good education systems, the security, the wonderful, the wonderful libraries, and speaking against uh, uh, the iconic architects, in fact, it's not the occasional bauble. I mean, it's not the Eiffel Tower that makes Paris wonderful. It's the rest of Paris and its amenity and its streets and its cafes. That's what makes it wonderful. And what makes, has made Toronto and Canadian cities extraordinary is their aggregate form. It's the kind of communitas of the whole community that makes it wonderful. We have value in our public institutions. We have value in our streets. They are safe. And we mix our communities in a wonderfully diverse way. Let's not lose that and really don't vote the conservatives on the 24th. <laughs>